Maritime Southeast Asia is a cluster of small and large islands that sit between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Historically part of the East Indies and contemporary known as the Malay Archipelago, the area has some of the world's highest levels of biodiversity for marine ecosystems. Here, coral, fish and mollusks thrive. Yet perhaps the prevailing characteristic is the maritime-based cultures that are represented by the nations of the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei and Singapore. All of this makes for a unique archipelagic neighborhood with its own distinct geopolitical needs. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. In its entirety, the Malay archipelago exists of more than 25,000 islands, which range from large land masses such as Borneo, Sumatra, Jaffa, Sulawesi, Mindanao and Luzon to tiny dots on the map. The interior of these larger islands are covered by jungles and highlands, while the fertile coastlines host large-scale human settlements. In this environment, it's easier to travel by sea than by land. Most of the seas in the Malay archipelago are shallow, warm and somewhat free of salt when compared to other parts of the world. There are a few deep underwater trenches, but overall, these are optimal conditions for marine ecosystems. In addition, with the exception of the Philippines, most of maritime Southeast Asia is free of typhoons and hurricanes. There are, however, many active volcanoes in the area, and the islands are vulnerable to earthquake activity. Maritime Southeast Asia is also one of the most culturally diverse areas in the world. The 380 million people that live in the region belong to a wide range of ethnic and linguistic groups. The majority are descendants of the Austronesian people, whose explorations were driven by the monsoon winds. These wind systems, which blow frequently from the northwest and then reverse to blow from the southeast, enabled travelers, merchants and missionaries from distant lands to arrive and leave at regular intervals. In time, this encouraged the exchange of foreign ideas. The Hindu statecraft and Confucian philosophy were some of the early foreign concepts that played a decisive role in the shaping of the kingdoms between the 5th and 15th century. By the 10th century, Muslim traders from the Arabian Peninsula introduced Islam to the region, which became the dominant faith by the 16th century. The remote areas, however, particularly in Polynesia, were largely unaffected by the cultural trade and retained their indigenous cultures. Still others were acquainted with Christianity when they made contact with the European explorers. All this cultural diversity makes for a unique scope of the surface, but from a geopolitical angle, it is also a barrier to national unity and a backdoor to foreign intervention. The truth is that many of the local governments in the Malay archipelago lack political authority over their domains. This reality is rooted in history. In the 19th century, the European colonial powers strengthened the ethnic groups living in the borderlands to subvert the central feudal rulers. This trend continued during the Cold War when the United States and the Soviet Union armed regional rebels to fight the central governments. A century of divide and conquer has instilled a legacy of rebellion that has persisted to this day. The ethno-linguistic groups that populate the remote borderlands and islands often feel no sense of loyalty to their central governments. Another striking trend in the Malay archipelago is that most nations lack capable navies, despite being in a predominantly maritime area. The Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia spend about 1% of their GDPs on defense. That is not enough, but it ties in with the fact that the countries are beset with separatist groups. As such, the governments are forced to prioritize the conventional army and air force over the development of the navy. This decision is not an easy one, but necessary nonetheless if the separatist rebellions are to be contained. In general, maritime Southeast Asia is an unforgiving region. But some states are better positioned than others. 
As a nation with more than 17,000 islands, Indonesia is the embodiment of Southeast Asia's potential and shortcomings. The country sits at the nexus of global trade, where the Indian Ocean meets the South China Sea and the Pacific. It has the world's fourth largest population and the single largest in the Muslim world. Indonesia also has an abundance of natural resources and an impressive manufacturing sector. It is projected that the country will emerge as the fourth largest economy in the world by 2050. In other words, the Republic of Indonesia is a sleeping giant. Yet Indonesia is also an enormous country, perhaps too big for its own good. The distance from end to end equals to that between Paris and Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. The heartland of Indonesia, located in Jaffa, ranks as the most populous island and is home to 145 million people, or about 55% of the total population. Jaffa is also Indonesia's agricultural heartland and sits by the Jaffa Sea, which links to the South China Sea and the Karimata Strait, to the Makassar Strait, the Flora Sea and the Banda Sea. These seas connect the Jaffa heartland to the other main regions, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi and Western New Guinea. The capital Jakarta dominates the political landscape of the country, but Indonesia has no singular ethnic, linguistic, cultural or religious identity. Instead, there are over 300 ethno-linguistic groups. As such, Jakarta, which is dominated by the ethnic Javanese, has never managed to exercise complete control over the entire nation. Maintaining political unity is therefore Indonesia's primary geopolitical objective and shapes the country's strong centralized government. But the pursuit of this objective has also upset many indigenous populations in the borderlands. As a result, the Jakarta government is currently dealing with seven distinct separatist groups, ranging from Aceh on the northern tip of Sumatra to West Papua, which sits at a distance of some 3,000 kilometers east of Jaffa. Moreover, most of the rebellion hotspots are in areas that are rugged, underdeveloped and covered in jungle. In 1999, Jakarta lost control over East Timor altogether, which illustrates just how difficult it is to maintain political unity. But what makes it even worse is Indonesia's long coastline. With more than 50,000 kilometers of coastline, Jakarta cannot sustain a coast guard capable enough to fully patrol such a vast area. This means that the government does not have complete control over its territorial integrity and therefore cannot defend itself from foreign powers. Taken together, the ethno-linguistic tensions and the lack of control over the coastlines constitute as Indonesia's primary vulnerabilities. For this reason, Jakarta does whatever it can to avoid picking a side in its immediate environment. The government essentially wants to be left alone and wants to discourage foreign powers from exploiting its internal divisions. All this explains the dormancy of Indonesian policymakers and why the country is unlikely to adjust its passive geopolitical policy. To the north lies the Philippines, a nation of contrast. Luzon Island, which includes the capital Manila, is highly urbanized and boasts a sophisticated society that numbers around 57 million people. However, Luzon is one of the three primary clusters of the country. The other two include the island groups of Visayas and Mindanao, which host 19 million and 25 million people respectively. Taken together, the three island chains consist of more than 7,000 islands and nearly 200 ethnicities. Luzon in the north forms the Filipino heartland, but the further south one travels, the poorer the living conditions get and the weaker the central authority is. Due to these social, economic and cultural divisions, maintaining political union is Manila's primary task. In addition to the internal considerations, as a former de facto colony of Spain and the United States, the Philippines has historically acted as a gateway between continental East Asia and Western powers. 
that geopolitical legacy is reflected in the modern power struggle in maritime Southeast Asia. China's surge in the region has driven Beijing to forge an alliance with Manila, preferably a Patreon-client relationship which would allow the Chinese to bypass the strategic choke points that run from Indonesia to Japan. At the same time, the Americans want to contain China within those lines by maintaining the current alliance with the Philippines. This stalemate essentially leaves Filipino policymakers with two options. They can either acknowledge China's sphere of influence and operate at the behest of Beijing, or they can continue to rely on the support of the global naval power whose homeland is more than 11,000 kilometers away and whose commitment has proven to be dubious. So neither option is particularly great. In recent years, however, due to the efforts of President Duterte, Manila has sought to find a balance between the two powers by improving its economic relationship with China while reducing its security arrangement with the United States. The Filipino government is so fixated on maintaining political union that it doesn't have the strength to stand up against Chinese and American advances. Yet by playing the two powers against each other, Manila hopes to enforce its own foreign policy. Far away from the great political games is the nation of Brunei, which occupies a small segment on the northern coast of Borneo. In geopolitics, the seclusion of Brunei has given the country the time to develop itself, and with a GDP per capita of $78,000, the country has a lot to show for. However, Brunei's prosperity depends on the export of hydrocarbon resources, which are expected to run out in the next two decades. So the country will have to completely overhaul its economy if it wants to maintain its wealth. Yet Brunei is too isolated to compete in high-value sectors and too rich to compete in low-value sectors. These conditions discourage Western investments in the country. The only outside power that has stepped up is Beijing. Chinese state companies are aiding the government of Brunei in the development of its industrial sector and the upgrade of its infrastructure. In exchange for this economic aid, Brunei is looking the other way when it comes to Beijing's encroachment in the South China Sea. In the long term, this will inevitably strengthen China's foothold in the area, but Brunei has no one else to turn to. Meanwhile, on the other side of the sea, in Singapore, things are looking better. Located at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula, Singapore sits between the South China Sea and the Malacca Strait. This strategic position has allowed the city-state to emerge as a global hub for shipping and banking. What is less known is that Singapore has also acquired some of the best military equipment available and integrated complex weapon systems cohesively thanks to the efforts of Western allies. As a result, Singapore has one of the finest naval and air forces in maritime Southeast Asia. All these elements allow the city-state to punch well above its weight on the geopolitical level. However, Singapore also has significant vulnerabilities. Most obviously, its small size deprives the country of strategic depth, meaning the city-state has nothing to fall back on, and it could lose everything in a single stroke. The risk of blowback is so great that Singapore does whatever it can to avoid upsetting the larger powers. As such, Singapore has surprisingly favorable economic relations with regional and global powers. However, in the past decade, due to Beijing's increasing activities in the South China Sea, Policymakers in Singapore are worried that geopolitical tensions will affect the local maritime traffic. To prepare itself for such a scenario, Singapore has expressed a willingness to team up with the Americans. Already, the country hosts rotating deployments of US warships and military ties between Singapore and Washington are improving across the board. If this trend continues, Singapore could break from tradition and join the coalition against China in the near future.
The final actor in maritime Southeast Asia is Malaysia, which is technically also part of mainland Asia, but its national interests are more in line with the archaeopelagic group. Malaysia's geopolitical value stems from its proximity to the world's busiest sea lanes. The fragmented geography of the country, which is split between Malaysian Borneo and Peninsular Malaysia, acts as an important check on the seaborne trade that transits through the Malacca Strait. More precisely, the western coastline from Johor Bahru to Penang in Peninsular Malaysia is essential to secure the free flow of trade through the Malacca Strait. This coastline also happens to be the industrial and political heartland of the country, where the capital Kuala Lumpur is located. Malaysia's Indian and Chinese communities, which account for about 30% of the total population, are also situated in the heartland. Malaysian Borneo makes up roughly 60% of the country's landmass, but only hosts 20% of the total population. Here, the extraction of hydrocarbon resources plays an increasingly important role in the economy of the country. However, to secure its long and complicated coastlines, Kuala Lumpur maintains an alliance with Washington. Having said that, Malaysia also plays a critical role in the Chinese designs for Southeast Asia. This is highlighted by Beijing's selective investments in the country. Now, ordinarily, foreign investment is an objective for most countries. In Malaysia, however, Chinese investments have acted as a source of friction. More precisely, Beijing fully understands the polarized nature of Southeast Asia, and in Malaysia, China exploits the peculiar post-colonial borders and the deep ethnic tensions within those territories by promoting regional economic disparities. For instance, Beijing will invest funds in one area with the aim to drift that particular region away from Kuala Lumpur while at the same time stimulating economic disparity. It's essentially Beijing's way of divide and conquer. Today, the central government of Malaysia maintains a firm hold over its territories. However, should Kuala Lumpur ever fall into political instability, the semi-autonomous regions of Malaysia would be exposed to foreign intervention. As such, maintaining political stability and unity while being vigilant with foreign investments is the primary objective for Malaysian policymakers. Now, more than ever, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei need to forge multilateral frameworks for military, political and economic cooperation as is envisioned by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Each state also needs to find ways to maintain political unity while bolstering their naval capabilities. This is a region where land divides and sea unites. Having a capable navy is not a choice, but a geopolitical necessity if one is to survive. I have been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Credit goes to our community on Patreon for giving us the means to research and produce content like this. If you want to learn more or gain access to some perks, visit our community on patreon.com slash caspianreport. For now, thank you for your time and sahol.